Okay. Carrying on with the Gospel of Mark. That May is beginning to look like that's not going to happen, but that's okay. Now, and I've got to get the queen in here. Come on, queen. Mark chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15. Jesus comes to Galilee proclaiming the gospel or the good news of God. And, and this good news is that at long last, God in his timing is acting to heal the broken, sin-sick creation. He's asserting his sovereignty and rulership to create the divine utopia, to bring about the long-awaited kingdom of God. And this gospel of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ, because Jesus, God the Son, is the means of healing and rescue. He is the means of that. Contrary to expectations, however, Jesus ushering into the kingdom of God, it has two phases or stages to it. The kingdom is introduced or inaugurated or planted at Jesus' first coming. And then there's an interval of time when the kingdom coexists with this fallen world. It coexists. We live in that overlap of ages. And then there's a decisive intervention at Christ's return, at his second coming, when the kingdom is, is consummated or finalized, when all that's contrary to the eternal vision of God is stripped out. This is the time when there will be no more death or mourning or crying or suffering or sin or pain. And so it's then consummated. In chapter 1, verses 16 to 20, Jesus calls two pairs of fishermen brothers to follow him, at least two of whom, Peter and Andrew, lived in Capernaum. And that's presumably why in, in chapter 1, verses 21 to 28, they go into Capernaum, where Jesus teaches in the synagogue on the Sabbath. As we saw last week, there's a man in the synagogue who's possessed by a demon. And the demon interacts with Jesus through the man with both hostility and fear. The demon shouts, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebukes him, commanding him to be silent and tells him to come out of the person. Now, unlike other exorcists of the time, and there were other exorcists, you remember the seven sons of Sceva, for example. There were other exorcists, but unlike other exorcists of the time who relied on incantations and various rituals to coerce demons into submissions, they had techniques. You see, so unlike these other exorcists who relied on these techniques, these incantations or these rituals, Jesus relies simply on his innate authority. He doesn't employ any rituals. He simply says, get out. And out he goes. Now the demon throws the man into convulsions, perhaps a last futile attempt to injure the person. And then he exits him with a loud shriek. Now can you imagine this scene? Huh? Out comes this demon with this shriek. That's why John and I joke sometimes when a child will yell or something, I go, those demons going out, whoop! <laughs> but you can just imagine this scene. And again, the people are astonished and they ask each other, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Mark Strauss in his commentary says, notice that they refer first to Jesus' authority in teaching and only second to the exorcism. Jesus' primary mission is to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. The exorcisms and healings are not showy displays of his power for self-aggrandizement, but evidence that the power of the kingdom of God is breaking into human history through the Messiah's words and deeds. You see, he's like pulling the not yet into the now. He's ushering in 
the kingdom of God. And at his first coming, Jesus not only announced the kingdom's arrival, he's introducing it. He's inaugurating. He not only announced the kingdom's arrival, but he also demonstrated the kingdom's character. And he gave us a foretaste of it. As John Piper said in his sermon on, uh, titled Christ and Cancer, I've mentioned this before, he says the answer to why Jesus did not raise all the dead. People sometimes say that. Well, if he's got all this miracle working power, why didn't he go and raise everybody? And Piper says the answer to why he didn't raise all the dead is that contrary to the Jewish expectation, you remember the one-shot deal? Coming, bang, and then the new age. Contrary to the Jewish expectation, the first coming of the Messiah was not the consummation and full redemption of this fallen age. The first coming was rather to purchase that consummation, illustrate its character, and bring a foretaste of it to his people. Therefore, Jesus raised some of the dead to illustrate that he has that power and one day will come again and exercise it for all his people. And he healed the sick to illustrate that in his final kingdom, this is how it will be. There will be no more crying or pain anymore. You see, so he's exhibiting the character of the kingdom of God as it will be in its consummated state. Now we live in the overlap of ages where death and disease and suffering and things coexist with the kingdom. But a day is coming when that will no longer be true. And he's illustrating that by these, these things that he's doing. Now verse 28 says that his fame was spreading throughout Galilee. It was rapidly becoming known in the words of that old Buffalo Springfield song that something's happening here. You know, they recognized that something is going on with him. And then in verses chapter 1 of 29 to 34, Jesus and the four brothers, they go to Simon and Andrew's home in Capernaum. And it's quite likely that this very home has been discovered by archaeologists. They go to, they go to the home there, and this home, that Peter and Andrew's home, probably has been discovered. Very likely it has been discovered. As I mentioned in the class on archaeology in the Bible, in 1968, Virgilio Corbo and Stanislaw Lafreda, they began investigating a 5th century octagonal church building that's located just 84 feet south of the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, during the, what's known as the Byzantine era, which includes the 5th century, that's the, this is a 5th century octagonal church. Now, during the Byzantine era, which includes the 5th century, octagonal churches were built over sacred sites. That was just something that they did, built over sacred sites in the Holy Land. Now, beneath this 5th century octagonal church was a 4th century church. And beneath that 4th century church was a house dating to the middle of the first century. And the walls of the house, they were narrow. So narrow that they would not support a masonry roof. Meaning that the roof of this house would have been made of wooden slats. And then you would have branches and thatch put in there and covered with dirt. Just like the one we're going to look at in Mark chapter 2 verse 4 which is probably Peter's house. The walls, the ceiling, and the floor of this first century home, of, of the central room of this first century home, they were plastered in the first century, as was done with public rooms that were used for special purposes. So here we have this house, and the central room of this house is plastered in the first century, which was what was done for public rooms that were used for special purposes. It's the only house known in Capernaum to have plastered walls, and the walls and the floors had been replastered at least twice 
Now, in the mid-first century, there was a change in the pottery that was used in this central room, indicating that the room had changed from normal residential living Something's going on. This is now a public room that is plastered. It is no longer used as a residence. It is used for some other purpose. There are more than 150 inscriptions scratched in the plaster walls in Greek, Syriac, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Latin. Beginning in the second century and perhaps even in the late first century when these inscriptions begin... They include appeals to Christ for help, possible references to Peter, and various Christian symbols like crosses. Now sometime after the first century, the roof of this central room is elevated, and this is the, it, it's lit, lifted, and this is the only house in the area that's been identified by archaeologists, pilgrims, and ancient tradition as Peter's house. And that 5th century octagonal church is centered on this room. It is centered there on this room. Now many scholars are persuaded by this evidence that this is in fact Peter's house in Capernaum. So here he, he goes to the synagogue and we have what is very likely the synagogue where he was. South of there in Capernaum we have what is very likely Peter's house under this octagonal church. Now, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law of fever. And then that evening, as you can imagine, the house is mobbed with people from the city. They're bringing their sick and their demon-possessed to be healed. Now, you notice that these uh, first century people understood the difference between sickness and demon possession. Yeah, people, uh, you know, they were just all, you know, they were like uh, troglodytes. They didn't know anything. Ignoramuses. They all thought somebody had a cold. It was a demon. No, they understood the difference. <laughs> you see, they recognized that. And Mark says hyperbolically, the whole city was gathered together at the door. Jesus healed him, and he again commands the demons not to speak because they knew who he was. And then in chapter 1, verses 35 to 45, I know that's an eye test, but I wanted to put it all in one thing. Jesus goes out to a desolate place before daylight, and he prays there. And then Peter's search party, they locate him, and they tell him everybody's looking for him. And Jesus tells them they need to go to other towns so he can preach there. As he came to announce or inaugurate the kingdom of God, a task that is not limited to Capernaum. So he says, I, I need to go and preach and proclaim this message elsewhere. Mark Strauss says, Jesus apparently avoided the larger cities of Galilee, Galilee like Tiberius and Sepphoris, which are never mentioned in the Gospels, and I find that interesting. Here you have these two larger cities in Galilee, and they're not mentioned. All of these other little places, towns and villages are mentioned. Now Mark reports in verse 39 that Jesus preached in the synagogues throughout Galilee and he cast out demons. Now he healed diseases. As the text and other summaries of Jesus' work make clear, but exorcisms may be emphasized by Mark because they're such direct expressions of spiritual dominance. Such direct expressions of this invasion of the kingdom of God into the present. So here you see this idea that he's commanding these demons to leave. And that may be why that's emphasized. Well, a leper comes to him at an unidentified location and he begs to be healed, declaring his confidence that Jesus is able to heal him if he chooses to do so. So it's not a question about his power. He has confidence Jesus is able to heal him if he wants to, if he chooses to do so. Now Jesus is moved with compassion. He touches the man and heals him immediately. And I should point out there is a textual variant, okay, that has very little external support. It seems... Probably that it's not original. 
But it has Jesus being angry as he heals the man. Now, if that text will, if that were original, well, it would simply mean that Jesus was angry at Satan or sin, or sin for the suffering it had brought. Not that he was angry at the man. But as I say, I think that's probably not original. Now, rather than the leper making uh, Jesus ritually unclean, this is interesting too, as you know, uh, typically in the Mosaic Law, if you touch a leper, well, then the leper is ritually unclean. He touches you, you become ritually unclean. And you have to understand, ritually unclean is different from sin. Okay, ritual defilement was part of everyday life. Like if you touched a dead body or something like that, you had emissions. Uh, you know, there, it's just part of life. It is a ritual defilement. It is something different than sin. But still, in the Mosaic Law, if the ritually defiled touches something, then that thing becomes ritual. That's not how it is with Jesus. You see, that's not how it is. Jesus heals and cleanses the leper. And Jesus tells the man not to talk about the healing, but to show himself to the priest and to make the offerings that are prescribed in Leviticus chapter 14 for a cleansed leper. You say, well, what's this about? Well, this priestly certification of his healing, that was necessary for, his, for him to regain acceptance into Israelite society. You see, he's been cleansed and healed. Now he has to have that certified by the priest so he's then acceptable to everybody. And so Jesus tells him, you go and do that, and then you will be reintegrated into Israelite society. And the healed leper's excitement gets the best of him, and contrary to the Lord's instruction, he spread the, spreads the news of the miraculous healing. Now, I have, to, I have sympathy with this. You know, I mean, this guy's just like, you can't shut him up. And that's really how we should be, you see, with what's happened to us is that it just is something that we're so excited about, so thrilled that God has done this work in our lives. Well, here he is. He's so excited about that. He ignores the Lord's instructions. He spreads the news. And as a result, the crowds that are drawn to Jesus were so large that it was too disruptive for him to enter a town openly. Now, you get a picture of what's going on here? I mean, he is a happening in Galilee. He can't even go into the town. And for that reason, he chose at that time to remain outside of the towns. But even then, people kept flocking to him. Outside the towns, you have these crowds coming to him. They knew. There's something here. This guy's not a pretender. This guy's not somebody we're suspicious about going, well... I wonder, no, I hear him saying these things, but I'm just not sure. They said, this guy is different. There's something going on with this person, and they kept flocking to him. Well, in chapter 2, 1 to 12, Jesus was able to slip back into Capernaum. He's able to slip back in there, but the news quickly spread that he'd returned. So here he is, he goes back into Capernaum, but you know, Word gets out, we spotted him, and here come the people, and they mobbed the house where he was staying, which presumably was Peter's house, same place where he had been. They mobbed it to such an extent that all access to Jesus was blocked. You couldn't get through to him as Jesus, and Jesus was preaching to them the word, meaning the message of the kingdom of God. This is what people had longed for, waited for. This is this momentous thing that now, now, the kingdom of God is breaking in. And so Jesus is here and speaking about this and telling the people about the kingdom of God. And you have four men, they come to the house, they arrive there, and they're carrying this paralytic man on a stretcher. A friend they're bringing to Jesus for Jesus to heal them. And we don't know about, we don't know how long, how this man came to be paralyzed. How long he'd been in that condition. And the crowd is stuffed in around the house so tightly. 
They're just crammed in this little place and coming out the door and all around that you can't get through. The crowd is that dense, packed in, that you can't go and get and approach Jesus through the door. He's got that kind of a crowd going on. So they go, they take the outside access to the roof. You know, there are stairs on the outside of the building, of the house, to a flat roof up there. So they go around the side, they take this, the outside access to the roof, and this roof would have been flat, made with these wooden cross beams, and then you'd have branches and maybe uh, palm leaves or, or straw, and then covered with dirt on this, this roof that you have here. And they begin digging through the dirt and pulling the thatch away. And you can imagine that, right? You can imagine these people are down inside and up here in the roof. Here comes all of this digging and noise and dirt falling in and all of this stuff. Finally, they clear it away and they're able to lower this man between the cross beams. Right here. And so they had all of these obstacles, opportunities to quit. To give up and say, no, this is, well, it was, we wanted to. We wanted to get to Jesus, but it was just impossible. You're sorry, man. You know, we wanted to. They had all of that opportunity to do that, and they didn't do it. They just went, uh, they went for it. <laughs> and they go and they lower him down there. Now, seeing their faith, you see, as expressed in their effort and their persistence to reach him, Jesus tells the paralyzed man his sins are forgiven. Seeing their faith in their effort and persistence to reach him, he says your sins are forgiven. Now there's a general sense in which all sickness, all debilitation, all suffering, they're related to sin's invasion and corruption of creation. We live in a fallen world, but it's also the case that sickness, debilitation, and suffering can be, okay, can be related more specifically to an individual's sin in the way of divine punishment or discipline. Now, it may be that Jesus knew. It may be that he knew that this particular man's condition was related to his sins in that more specific sense and that his healing, therefore, necessarily involved forgiveness of his sins. I mean, that may be the case, but it's also possible his condition was not related specifically to his sins and that Jesus announced the forgiveness of his sins, which that man, like all of us, needed simply to highlight his unique authority to forgive. It could simply be Jesus taking this occasion to announce this man's forgiveness to show and to put in issue his unique authority to forgive. But whatever the reason for the announcement, it did, it did in fact raise the issue of Jesus' authority. I mean, that's a bold thing to say. And it raised that question of his authority, and the scribes were thinking he was blaspheming. They're thinking he was blaspheming by claiming for himself a power that is reserved exclusively for God. Jesus knew what was in their hearts. Now, that's very significant. He knew what was in their hearts, which is something that's true only of God. Only God knows the hearts of people. You see that in 1 Kings 8.39, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 30. And here with this opposition that we're getting, this is the first sign of opposition to Jesus in the gospel. It will certainly will not be the last. But here you're starting to see, all up to this point is like crowds and Man, this is something, something. Now you're starting to see somebody's chapped. Okay? Somebody's chapped. And you'll just see this, and we know where it winds up, uh, where it leads. Now, given their internal grumbling, 
that he knows, given that internal grumbling about his announcement, he asks them, he says, whether, what's easier to say? He doesn't say what's easier to do. He says, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven. Or to say, rise up, take your stretcher, and walk. Well, the former, your sins are forgiven. That's easier to say. That's easier to pretend to achieve because the claim to have forgiven sins cannot be verified objectively. Whereas there's no faking the claim to heal this, no doubt, well-known man's paralysis. You're going to say, get up, take, and walk. I'm standing there waiting. And? All right. So which is easier to say? Something that can't be objectively verified? Or something that can be? Okay? Well, the latter, it, 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 the former is easier to say. Because you can't verify it that way. So Jesus tells them that he will perform the verifiable, miraculous healing, the thing that can't be faked as evidence. He says that you may know. He's going to do the thing that can't be faked so they will know that the thing that could be faked, the forgiveness of sins, was not faked. Okay? That's what he's doing. That he does indeed have the authority to forgive sins. Now this is not a logical proof. This is not a deductive argument where you get down to and it closes the door and makes a complete conclusion. It's not a logical proof as he conceivably could be able to heal without being able to forgive. I mean that, that's a logical possibility, right? Rather what this is, it's support for his claim to be able to forgive. In other words, one who can perform such a tremendous miracle is more likely to be able to forgive someone's sins than one who cannot perform that miracle. So that's what Jesus is doing. They're sitting here going, this guy's blasphemy. He says, well, let me wait. What's easier to say? Is it easier for me to say this or to say that? Well, man, you can't be saying that because your stuff's right out there. You, you do that and you're, you're exposed if you're a fake. He says, all right, well, watch this. Rise and walk. Mm. Okay, now you see that? That ought to get you thinking about this one. That ought, that ought to cause you to think. So Jesus tells that paralytic, rise, take up your stretcher, and go home. And he rose and he waltzed out in front of all of them. Now you have to think about this. I know you've, you, you've read this a million times, but you be in a situation where you know that this person is paralyzed. He's not a ringer. He's not a fake. We know who he is. And here's Jesus, and he tells him that. And Mark exclaims, they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. We never saw anything like this. Where a man we know is paralyzed, and then he comes and he simply says, get up. You see, this, this is just amazing. People say, well, I wonder how Christianity started. This is how it started. It started because we had the miracle-working Son of God among people and showing them, this is who I am. And they all said, whoa. You see, this is the real deal. In thir verses 13 to 17, Jesus is again, he's teaching large crowds by the Sea of Galilee. And as he's walking along, he sees Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting in a tax collector's booth. Now, Levi, who in the Gospel of Matthew is identified by his presumably second name, Matthew, he works for Herod Antipas, who's the Tetrarch of Galilee. And he collects a toll or a duty, a tax on goods in transit, such as fish caught in the Sea of Galilee. Okay, so you got your haul, you're ready to take it somewhere and sell it, and the tax man cometh. 
And he's there saying, hmm. Mark Strauss in his commentary, he says, tax collectors, tax collectors were despised because of their reputation for dishonesty, their exorbitant surcharges, and their duplicity with oppressive rulers, both the Romans and their client kings like Herod Antipas. Since they made their living from the money they could collect over and above the taxes owed, extortion and corruption were rampant. You see, these people had government power and they were invested in getting you to give more money because if I don't get above the taxes, I don't make anything. I just have to give those taxes. So I'm interested in getting more. And so it was just a corrupt system. And the people were like that, and that's why they were, they were simply despised. You see, they were uh, you know, hated by everybody. And that popular contempt, though, you have to recognize that's how these people were seen. It's not simply they had a crummy occupation. They were corrupt. They were cheaters, abusers of power. And yet, despite that popular contempt, Jesus calls Levi to follow him. You would think, no, that's not the politically expedient thing to do. You're building a following. You're a religious man. How can you possibly call this person who will turn people off? That's not, that's not good thinking, Jesus. You know, you need to focus group this. You need to go do that. Well, Jesus calls him to follow him, and which Levi promptly does... And Levi then hosts a formal banquet or a dinner party. And that it's a formal banquet or dinner party is indicated by the fact they were reclining, which is how they would eat in that kind of setting. He hosts this at his home where many tax collectors and other sinners ate with Jesus and his disciples. Now, when Mark speaks of sinners, he's, here, he's, he's referring to unscrupulous riffraff. That's what he's talking about. Those who were sinners in a way distinct from the disciples. Okay, who of course are sinners in a literal sense. Everybody's a sinner. But these people he's labeling sinners here are unscrupulous riffraff. That's who's with Jesus here that he, in this, this meal here. And there were many such people at the dinner... Because the number of people following Jesus was so large that it included many of them who presumably had been invited by Levi. And the scribes of the Pharisees, they asked Jesus' disciples. They said, look, why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? This is, this is just bad form. Mark Strauss says, in Judaism... A scrupulous Pharisee would never eat at the home of a common Israelite since he could not be sure that the food was ceremonially clean and that it had been properly tithed. He would especially not eat with a defiled and sinful tax collector. The Pharisees expect Jesus, a respected rabbi, to act in the same exclusive manner. Why is he doing this? What is going on? And Jesus answered them by applying a common proverb to his ministry. He has come to call the sick. He's come to call the spiritually needy to the restoration and the healing that is bound up with the kingdom of God. That's what he's doing. Indeed, their presence at the banquet with Jesus that points to God's heart that all sinners, all sinners end up sharing in the eschatological banquet, the end time banquet, the glory of the consummated kingdom of God. God wants every human being there. And that's reflected in Jesus' openness to the call, calling these people having interaction with them that they might come to the kingdom. He's not quarantining them. He's not saying, no, I understand, they're unscrupulous riffraff. They're beyond the pale. They've fallen off the edge of the earth. Through with them. Never through. 
God is never through. And I'm telling you, that's one of the greatest things in the world. As I've said many times, I don't care what you've done, how often you've done it, how long you've done it. Okay, the well of God's mercy is always open for the penitent. Always. Okay, now you may be beating yourself to death, but I am telling you that God is calling and his arms are open. You just need to come to him. You just need to come to him. So we have at, at this thing, he, that's what God wants. In verses 18 to 22, in 18 to 22, <clears throat> yeah, there it is. 18 to 22. Now on the heels of being accused of blaspheming and claiming to forgive sins and being questioned about eating with tax collectors and sinners, on the heels of that, will people ask him, Why his disciples don't fast like the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees. Now the Old Testament prescribed a national fast on the Day of Atonement. It prescribed that. And it seems from 1 Samuel chapter 14 verse 24 and Jeremiah chapter 36 verse 6 that a fast could be called in special times of penance, such as times of crisis or emergency. And several fasts apparently had become customary after Judah's exile to Babylon. Fasts that fell on days that were significant in terms of the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem. So it seems that fast had, these fasts had become customary. Robert Gulick in his commentary on Mark, he says, Fasting was a common rite in Judaism with roots deep in the Old Testament. At times, it was an expression of mourning for the loss of someone or something. More often, it was an expression of contrition and penitence, a sign of repentance marked by the symbols of mourning. Combined with prayer, fasting was a statement of self-denial and self-humiliation, depicting one as self-effacing and submissive to God's will. In the intertestamental period, you know, from the close of the Old Testament to the first century, in this intertestamental period, fasting in Judaism really increased. You see, in Luke chapter 5, verse 33, it says the disciples of John fasted often. In Luke 18, verse 12, it indicates the Pharisees fasted twice a week. Okay, so this is really something that's getting some traction and you note Anna's fasting in Luke, 12, in Luke 2.37. Fasting had become in Judaism an expected mark of piety. This is how a righteous person did it. You see, this is how they did it. But Jesus and his disciples, they did not engage in regular voluntary fasts. They didn't do that. On the contrary, Jesus was more associated with feasting. So much so that he was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. You see in Matthew eleven nineteen and Luke seven thirty four. Now this was such an obvious difference, and I heard that first bell, so I know I'm not going to get through what I want to get through. But hey, uh, this was such an obvious difference between Jesus and his disciples on the one hand and the disciples of John and the Pharisees on the other, that he's asked to justify it. He's asked to explain the reason for the difference. Why don't your guys fast? Disciples of John fast. Disciples of the Pharisees fast. That seems to be the way true piety is reflected. What's the deal with you? And Jesus' answer. It is absolutely theologically loaded. It is theologically loaded, but it requires some background understanding to really grasp the weight and the import of what he's saying. He says, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, And then they will fast in that day. Now, according to Craig Keener in the Dictionary of New Testament Background, 
Jewish weddings, they normally lasted seven days. And many of the closest associates of the bride and groom remained for the full seven days. Keener says, Jewish people emphasized joyous celebration at wedding feasts. Texts often use weddings to symbolize the greatest joy in contrast to the epitome of sorrow, grief at a funeral. As one must mourn with the bereaved, one was also obligated to celebrate with the couple at a wedding. Julius Scott, Jr., in his book, Customs and Controversies, Intertestamental Jewish Backgrounds of the New Testament, he says, there were prescribed stages for the wedding celebration. Preparation of the bride, transfer of the bride from her father's home to that of the groom, the bride's introduction into the home of the groom, and blessings and festivities within the husband's home. The celebration included many guests, both invited and otherwise. Witnesses were required for the reciting of blessings throughout the week of the wedding. There, there were feasting and a general atmosphere of merriment and rejoicing. This is, what it, this is what is about a wedding. David Wenham, in his book on the parables, he says, The normal procedure seems to have been for the guests to gather at the bridegroom's house on the day appointed for the marriage. The bridegroom would, be the bride, would go to the bride's home to claim her, and then he would bring her in joyful procession to his own home. The eating and drinking would then begin and would often go on through the night. The coming of the bridegroom with his bride was thus the signal for the wedding feast to begin. You see, this is a signal of something very important. And Jesus says, he says that his disciples do not fast because the current period is like the celebration of a wedding feast when the groom is present. When the groom is present, Wenham says the implication is that something joyful and significant like a wedding is taking place in Jesus' ministry and furthermore that Jesus is the bridegroom at the wedding being the reason for the joy and celebration. The reason for the joy and celebration and the joyful and significant thing that's taking place in Jesus' ministry is the ushering in of the long-awaited kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was central to Jesus' ministry and his teaching. Again, that's why Jesus says in Matthew 13, 17, For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and didn't see it, to hear what you hear and didn't hear it. Do you understand the time in which you live? Do you understand what's going on, R.T. France? In his commentary on Matthew, he says, The prophets look forward to the day of eschatological, end time, restoration, healing of the sin-sick world. They looked forward to the time of eschatological re restoration, to the coming of what Jesus now calls the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew's terminology. I heard that, that, that bell. Let me finish this. The kingdom of heaven, it's the kingdom of God elsewhere. You see, he says, to the day of eschatological re restoration, to the coming of what Jesus now calls the kingdom of heaven, but saw it only in prefiguration and promise, not in ex existential reality. Like Abraham, who rejoiced to see my day, the prophet spoke of the grace given to you, aware that their service was not for their own benefit, but for yours, things which even angels are agog to get a glimpse of. There is an incredulous wonder running through these New Testament reflections on the privilege of those who live at the time when God's saving purpose comes to fruition. That's what Jesus is doing. It is that big, that momentous. Nothing has been the same. It is the pivot point of all history. His coming and his ministry, his life, death, resurrection. And that's what he's saying to them. The time is now. I heard that bell. Thanks for coming.